Thank you, Professor. Welcome once again. Um, the topic of our session last now is impact of research on society and examples of good practices um, from South America. So it was, it was in the morning, just now I asked um, professors for presentations. So first, Professor Ildeberto give us a presentation. Next, Professor Evert, and after that will be the time for questions, comments, and so on. Professor, the floor is for you. Okay, um, thank you. Um, uh, at for my first presentation, I, uh, it was a little bit more specific. And, and now I will give you a more general presentation. Okay? Uh, in, in my first presentation, I just uh, uh, forgot to um, send some um, uh, greetings to the remote uh, people that is watching me, probably is watching me. I send the link to some Brazilian students. Um, Olá, pessoal, tudo bem? Uh, so, um, as I told you, I will talk about a more general presentation now. It's not my next specific research uh, area. Uh, I've tried in this presentation to give you an overview about uh, three uh, interesting areas where uh, I think we have uh, very interesting opportunities to uh, have some kind of uh, collaboration. Um, first of all, I will talk a little bit about Brazil. Very uh, short numbers presentation. Uh, after that, I will talk about three areas that, in my point of view, are important areas. Um, I choose them based on my personal point of view and based also in some uh, uh, strategic movements of the Brazilian government. Okay? Um, so, and what about digital? Because for, I'm from the information technology, as I told you, I'm a computer scientist. And in my point of view, uh, technology is important, then are you um, more comfortable to talk about uh, uh, the digital area? Okay? And the areas are agriculture, yeah, um, digital health, and digital education. Um, I'm most comfortable to talk about digital education because I, I have some students here too. And, but here I probably try to give you some interesting cases of a Brazilian usage of a technology. Okay. Oh, what about Brazil? Yeah. Uh, Brazil is not so uh, just a carnival or parties or um, soccer games. Uh, yes, uh, I love a soccer game. Uh, I like carnival, not so much as a soccer game, but uh, I'm, for instance, I'm, I'm a fan of Lewandowski. Why not? Uh, my little kid has a, uh, they, uh, they uh, he asked me for a gift here from Poland, a shirt for Levin, uh, a shirt of Lewandowski. Okay. Um, but Brazil has other uh, interesting things to be discussed about. We have a, a 200,000 um, million of uh, inhabitants. Uh, we have uh, around 8 billion of square kilometers. We had uh, Amazon. In fact, we have uh, six biomas and uh, a very uh, friendly uh, people. And also, you have, I present you some numbers here from GDP, AGI, and in the South America, we are the largest uh, country and uh, the most powerful economy there. In the Mercosul, uh, we are the main player 
uh, in the trades. Uh, so, not um, how do I say? Uh, Paraguay is important. Um, Argentina is important. Brazil has uh, a protagonism in this uh, area. Um, talk a little bit about these three areas as I, uh, I prepare to you. First one, agriculture. Um, some facts about Brazilian agriculture. So this, this first phrase here, uh, I believe I, I'm not so happy when I wrote, because uh, we are not the largest country uh, on terms of arable land. If you just uh, make some search on Google, uh, that's uh, the uh, possibility of a digital word, you you find that uh, you have uh, uh, India, uh, United States, other countries. In fact, Brazil is the fifth position in the arable land today. But you have a, a very uh, big potential of uh, arable land, not considering the Amazon. Okay? And also considering improvements on uh, production efficiency. That's the point here. Uh, we produce a lot of uh, products there, mainly commodities. We are top five in 34 agric agricultural uh, products, commodities, but we have uh, um, potential to improve this more. Okay? Uh, so, we are the largest agricultural net exporter. There, th th those are some facts. Uh, I, I, I believe I can uh, show you more data about, but uh, it was, uh, I believe it was not the proposal here. Just to show you a shot about uh, our facts related to agriculture. And uh, as I told you, you have uh, the potential. And where uh, the strategic plan from government or from some big industries are uh, came in for. Okay, we have uh, here these areas. First one, the development, technology, innovation. We have interesting cases regarding, for instance, sugarcane uh, uh, crops production using uh, precision agriculture. Using drones, for instance, it's possible to monitor the area uh, using image processing, identify weeds, and uh, for uh, uh, self-driving tractors, it's possible to deliver the fertilizer in the specific areas where it most uh, needs. It's a red dawn for uh, some sugar cane industries in Brazil. They identify the weeds uh, or the possibility of the weeds and uh, attack this in advance. Okay, using GPS, you have autonomous tractors where the driver just watch. It, it, in fact, the driver is just to turn on the tractor during uh, the process, uh, and during the process, it is all controlled by uh, GPS. Okay, uh, we had in the next month in my city, Ribeirão Preto, the biggest. Uh, event regarding agriculture in South America, I guess. It's called AgriShow. We receive the uh, uh, guests or companies from the whole world. Uh, to give you an idea, uh, six, for six months later, uh, before, we don't have any uh, uh, room yet at our uh, hotel uh, our hostels. 
we have uh, people hosting in cities from 100 or 100 and a half kilometers from Ribeirão Preto to attend this event. It intends to move around 6 billion of reais. Okay. And so, this area for us is uh, very important, and uh, we have uh, uh, investments to be uh, delivered on that area. But uh, we have some treats, of course, and connectivity. In the cities, we have a very good connectivity, depending on the city. But in the rural areas, it's a little bit difficult. Uh, some uh, companies, for instance, uh, some uh, sugar cane companies, uh, make investments to develop uh, um, 3G connections, or in case now, um, 5G connections, to deliver the data from the drones, for instance, or from the other uh, uh, devices to improve decision-making and information system. Here, uh, artificial intelligence is applied to uh, make some uh, predictive analysis. Okay? Uh, I told you about the uh, sugarcane, because sugarcane is, is very strong in my region, but uh, in the middle of Brazil, in these states here, Mato Grosso, Mato Grosso do Sul, uh, they are very strong on soil production. And they also apply technology a lot to improve the production. But uh, we have, in addition to that, we have uh, the possibility to increase more, to be more efficient. That's the point I would like to, to tell you. So, at the same, we have uh, interesting investments on digital health. As the same, I will give you first some facts about the digital health. First, talking about the Brazilian healthcare. Um, here we have uh, the SUS. SUS is the unified uh, healthcare system. We provide support for seven percent of a Brazilian population for free. Um, so, you have a private uh, insurance, yes, we have, but uh, it's curious because uh, when someone uh, supported by the, the private uh, healthcare has some uh, difficult disease, uh, uh, Hair, hair cancer or something like that, who will support uh, the surgery? The Brazilian SUS. Okay, they send to the SUS to be uh, uh, supported there. And nowadays, uh, so, so here I have uh, another fact. We are the largest healthcare market in Latin America. They are trying to uh, make uh, investments on, on healthcare. Uh, in my uh, city, we have uh, the Faculty of Medicine and the best of uh, faculty medicine in, uh, in Brazil. Um, also, a very good hospital, 100% uh, uh, free, uh, Dutch for special cases in my university. Um, so, what are the strategic areas where the government is uh, making some investments or uh, deserving more, more attention? For instance, the data SUS. I told you about the SUS, okay, the unified healthcare system. It generates a lot of data about uh, the patients. It was not, or in fact, nowadays is not so much uh, managed, this data. And the government is investing about uh, uh, 83 million of reais 
to improve this information system for digitalization of public basic health care to support uh, the population. But I still, I still have a long way uh, to be walked here. Okay? Uh, well, considering the pressures of the pandemics, I note uh, increasing uh, the increased way of uh, telehealth. I don't know here, but uh, it's becoming common in, in Brazil. You have uh, uh, a medical consultant using the smartphone for the, the more easier cases as a flu or something like that. Okay. Um, so, and from, from the strategic point of view, we have uh, uh, recently the government announced an investment of uh, 14 million of uh, reais uh, in the, the system. But uh, I agree, uh, it is the best, no. It's uh, a little bit far away from, from that, but uh, we are walking to uh, try to, to give a very good health uh, assistance to, to the Brazilian population. For instance, if you came there to Brazil, probably you will be uh, supported for free. There is no restrictions for that. Okay. And finally, regarding uh, education. Um, I work in a high-level uh, institution, university, but from, for the earlier children and uh, uh, for the middle uh, students, college, etc., we have a gap of 34% of uh, this uh, age uh, are not in so full dedicating to students. That's a, a problem. And how, and even for my university, for instance, I offer, we offer there for, for business administration course, just uh, um, 80 uh, positions from the beginner students. We have a, um, if you want to get in in the university there, for business administration, you need to compete against uh, more 16 or 18 people. Okay, the, the competitive scenario is more, like, more or less like that. And how the government is uh, trying to solve this? Using distance learning, uh, we learn a lot of uh, with uh, the pandemics, in fact, there, and I believe it's the same situation here, the remote classes, the synchronous and the synchronous, etc., the learning environment, and we learn a lot about that, and I believe this is uh, the future. Why not? I really like to be here. I really like to deliver this speech here uh, in Poland, to travel, but it was possible to me to be in Brazil there. Uh, now it's, uh, uh, me, me, yeah, what time is it now? Yeah, 12, so, six, yeah, yeah. Six is the morning in Brazil now. And it was possible to me to deliver this speech from there. Okay, but I agree, it's better to be here. Of course, but it was possible. It is possible, and we to be possible. And they learned this <coughs> with the pandemic. Sorry. Okay, so you have a, a space to advance in this area there, uh, because mainly in Brazil we have a, a very interesting rate of internet penetration, about 17 percent of a population has internet connection. It uh, can be different from uh, areas, regions, but for instance, in, in Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, uh, Rio Grande do Sul, you have a very interesting support 
of uh, uh, internet connection, and some cities has uh, the possibility of uh, 5G connections, and etc. Yeah? <clears throat> if you take a look, uh, not regarding just education, but for e-commerce, it is very interesting number. Even for Poland companies, for instance, if you have a product or a service, you can offer to the Brazilians because you have a, a very interesting uh, e-consumers there. Okay? So you have uh, problems to solve, for instance, the delivery, but if you have an interesting service, fintech, whatever, you can offer. Oh. Um, so make your investments in Poland. You can offer to Brazil. Okay? Why not? It's supposed not to be because I have no money to investment, but for uh, big companies, why not? Okay? So I give you some idea if you want to open a company in Paraguay, uh, maybe I can be a partner. <laughs> uh, so, concluding my speech here, uh, in spite of the problems, yes, I agree you have uh, problems with corruption, uh, with uh, uh, some kind of uh, poverty, but you are the largest economy in South America. We are a member of the BRICS. You are a developed country. Uh, we have high rates of internet penetration. As I told you, you are a friendly people and we have a good climate, climate uh, times there. And we have an ocean of opportunities. The language can be a barrier, yes, but it can be uh, overcome. Okay, and so here you have a um, little bit more information. Uh, I forgot to told you in my first uh, speech, but uh, Madalena, Professor Margot Zata, uh, you can share my presentation for for free. You can take these uh, links here and here. You have uh, my email, and uh, you also can find me in the social networks, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, not TikTok, but uh, you can find me there, and to be, for me to be a pleasure to have you in my uh, network. Okay, thank you so much. You. Um, that's my speech for this, this moment. I'm free for answer your question. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Professor. Um, yeah, the time for questions will be after the next presentation. So just now I would like uh, Professor Evert, yes, Evert, the floor is for you. Give us okay. a good presentation. So I'm going to continue now. Um, I'd like to say that I'm also a huge football fan. I love Lewandowski, especially because he plays for Barcelona. We had the same colors of my team in Paraguay, Cerro Porteño. Uh, but my, my son, he doesn't like football. He likes rock music. He said, please, do you know Adam Darsky? I don't know who he is. Maybe you can help me. So he wants a t-shirt of Adam Darsky. Maybe if you can help me. I don't know. Okay. So my son is a rebel then, right? Yeah. Damn it. Sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't say anything. Okay. Well, uh, so uh, back to like I said, I I I teach very uh, like uh, first semester students in Paraguay. They're just out of high school, very young, very naive. And we, like, I mean, I, I said, we, we're going to start doing some, at least, attempt of research in Paraguay. So I was telling them about my, my the idea of, uh, that, that I like about the, 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 agreed, uh, the, the agreement with the, 
the European Union in, in the Mercosur. And I asked my student to look for possible uh, like uh, 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 situations or, or business opportunities or ideas that could be implemented through that agreement. And one of my students said, in Paraguay it's normal, I don't know here, so to work and to go to college. So it's pretty normal. I mean, they go to work at, in, the, in the morning and they study at night or in the afternoon. So let's say half of my students already work. And one of them, he's working in a bank. And he, he told me about this and, hey, uh, Professor, we have this uh, institution which is called Mesa de Finanzas Sostenibles. Would be uh, finance, uh, sustainable finance table or something. And I will explain you real quick what it is. Okay, so I, I, a little bit of uh, explaining uh, the role of the financial system play. And the story is that this table of the uh, finance table basically was born uh, five banks united and they kind of did a self-regulation uh, uh, task. So they say, we want to offer some services to our customers and especially in the agriculture and cattle business, but we are going to comply with what uh, the European Union and the United States and the, the first world, so to speak, the industrial world, are uh, regulating. So they start uh, creating these guidelines in order to get loans. So let's say you, you own cattle or you, you're uh, in agriculture, you're growing, um, I don't know, uh, soybean or something. In order to get those loans, you had to follow these guidelines. And I thought it was really interesting because it was not mandatory, it was not, uh, it, it was not a law, but they self-regulate themselves, which is really strange for banks, right? So you see there, first they, they say, okay, let's work as they work in Europe. Let's self-regulate ourselves, they, let's comply with sustainable um, activities, right? So, so they can be clean. So this is the story that this table started in 2012 with these four banks, Sudameris, Continental, Regional, and Vici. So actually it's one of the first in Latin America. So for, for the first time we did something good in Paraguay. And then it started to grow. So in 2014 they add two more banks one of them, the first uh, four are Paraguayans. On the second one is, one of them is from the Mennonites. We have a, a Mennonite colony in the Chaco, which is very productive and they have a lot of money. And Itao, which is a Brazilian bank. And then you see how uh, they start adding more members and now they have 18 members in this uh, table. So we had 13 private banks, two public banks, and three financial institutions. So they regulated first, and then the Central Bank of Paraguay emitted a resolution about this, uh, how to, let's say, um, implement clean techniques for cattle tree and agriculture. So I thought it was fine. Like, so we, were, we, we find this uh, interesting uh, idea, economic idea, and I asked my students to start searching. So they created with me this presentation. You see? And we had, for example, here three guidelines. The first one was created by the Sudameris Bank. It's for a livestock guy. So to get the loan, you had to follow these guidelines. 2017 was for agriculture, another bank, and the last one was in 2018. It was for agro-industrial guy, from Banco Continental. And the thing is, is every bank follows the same guideline. So you, if you want a loan for a small business, a big business, 
uh, regarding these, these uh, areas, you should follow. Otherwise, you won't get the loan. So it's the, the vision and mission of this of the table. These are the impacts, the, the ideas that they have, the values that they have. And for us, what was in, interesting is, like I said before, uh, how can uh, companies itself can start self-regulating and, and because it's not common. And by doing this, they get a lot of funds from the third floor uh, investment. Like uh, we, we have a, an institution, it's like AFD. So the banks are the intermediaries, the third party on, on this loan. So they, they manage the loan, but the money comes from a national institution. It can come also from the World Bank or the IMF. So here we see the, the alliance, the strategic alliance that this table has. So they work with many, many institutions from the US, from Europe, The good thing is it applies not only to the big, because we in Paraguay have uh, a lot of, not a lot, uh, a few people that owns a lot of land. So this also is one of the reasons of the inequ uh, the differences between you know, people there. Other alliances that they have, they work with uh, oh, NGOs and all that, with the stock market in, in Paraguay. So this is an example of good business practice. And that was one thing. And the other thing that all the research was uh, uh, conducted by my student. I, I sort of just uh, do like a, um, um, I, I advise a little bit. But most of this was created by my students. So they also look for the financial information. So this table represents 98% of the total loans of, of the system, which is incredible. Like, and it, it means that we are really following this, this guideline, these uh, eco-friendly guidelines. So these are the significant advances. You can see there. So this, you know, this, this is a good example of how can actually in Latin America we can do good work also. So we can start be, you know, our re economic relationship. First you can visit for one semester to see how Paraguay is like. And then if you like, we can start do, doing business. So this is a projection that they did. So the green investment will, will be the main type of investment in the world, especially with, with commodities. And also, like I, Professor Malgor Shada said, all our energy is 100% clean. We don't use nuclear, we don't use uh, charcoal, carbon, nothing. So everything is clean. So this is just an example of how I can work with my students and they did the, all the, the research for me. And this is a starting point for doing more research and in a more like complex uh, situation. So thank you, I just show you the, this example. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So now we can start a question session. So maybe Professor Joanna, you first comments and questions, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for both presentations, really engaging and, and uh, thought-provoking. And uh, I, I have a lot of questions, but for sure we will not uh, have time for all of them. But I would like to... Uh, 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 start uh, uh, with uh, something that really 
uh, kept my eye uh, during uh, your uh, presentation, Professor um, Ildeberto, about the agriculture uh, sector in Brazil that, of course, it is uh, one of the most important and you know, like, like the basic uh, uh, part of the economy and probably will be uh, developed further. Uh, uh, we should be uh, concentrated on, on this also in the eye of um, the Mercosur, uh, the European Union, um, um, agreement implementation, so so everything um, uh, just calls our attention in in this. But I would like to ask you about the the, the research on this um, on this sector, especially the improvement of the productivity of our, uh, agriculture sector, and how do you cooperate build this uh, triple uh, cooperation between you know the business I mean the agro business that is really strong uh, especially in Brazil uh, the university and the government I mean this kind of cooperation here in Poland is like the most difficult part of our <laughs> of our uh, uh, work and 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 uh, university life because we are all the time we are struggling yes just to um, implement uh, our research results in uh, in the economy, you know, in the business, and it's not like that the business comes to the university and asks us, uh, let's do some research and we will uh, pay you for this. It's not that easy, yeah. And I would like to ask uh, you about this kind of cooperation, especially in the agro business, because this sector is is once is very strong, but probably it's not very open to new methods, or maybe I'm wrong, because normally, you know, people are uh, used to do all the way the, uh, themselves, and you can show them, you scientists, I, I, I mean, you can show them how to produce more efficiently, uh, how to, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, enlarge the productivity of the, of the sector. Do you go to the business or business goes to you? Or maybe the government just says to you, uh, please, your university, you focus on this, this field. So how do you manage this uh, complicated cooperation? Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, it, I, I believe it depending on the, the area. Okay. Um, first, uh, I will consider in, uh, the link between government, uh, universities, and the producers, the farms, small farms or big farms. Uh, we have uh, uh, an institution called Embrapa. It's uh, the meaning is uh, um, research, uh, agricultural research. Uh, institution, more or less. Uh, it's a, a government institution. They uh, provide research about uh, agribusiness. Not for the big ones, but specific for the small ones. Uh, we call the homemade productions or something like that. Uh, lettuce, uh, vegetables, uh, the most of the production in Brazil for these items are from the small producers, not from the big producers, okay? And this institution, the Embrapa, provide students linking the uh, research and uh, the practices. They produce uh, tutorials, courses, and studies, etc., regarding this area. For the other side, we also uh, I also observe companies' investment for instance, for machinery in the sugar cane, I know um, a lot of companies for tractors, um, etc., uh, that develop specific machines um, to specific uh, uh, crops. And it, it, it is a, a two-way uh, link. Because uh, 
for instance, some sugar cane usings need a machine, and they look for a company that produce that machine and to sell that machine for the other companies. So uh, I observe in agriculture this, uh, this kind of uh, cooperation, um, either considering the Embrapa and either considering the, the, the companies. And uh, mm, uh, I, I would like to uh, ask also about the role of uh, Chinese technologies in, in all this, you know, because uh, we talk about the um, possible um, uh, uh, European Union and Mercosur cooperation and all this, and, and we have a lot of opportunities here in Poland, that's uh, obvious, but... Uh, we can observe that Brazil is really interested in the cooperation with, with developing and enlarging the cooperation with China. And uh, uh, last last week, a, a visit of, of your president, your new president, Lula da Silva, in uh, Beijing, and and so on. It was like uh, important uh, uh, event uh, for the global economy, probably global uh, international relations as well. And uh, China is uh, um, perceived as the, the uh, source of new technology in Brazil or not? I, I would like to ask you because, you know, in, here in Europe and probably in Poland as well, we have probably a, a, a specific and different view on, on this, uh, uh, on this um, um, uh, kind of cooperation and on the role China can play you know, yeah. in the global chess uh, 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 play. But uh, for you, I, I just believe that China plays a very special role. And how do you perceive this? And this is my one question. And the second very uh, uh, much connected with this. And what's the cooperation between your university? I mean the researcher and the research you make with the Chinese universities in this, in this field. Uh, okay, uh, <laughs> very good question. <laughs> uh, so, um, the investment of China in, in technology in Brazil, uh, I can uh, tell you about a project that I uh, participate uh, two years ago, I, I think I don't remember it, uh, exactly. We, uh, in Brazil, we had a law called uh, Information Technology Law uh, that uh, provides some uh, uh, benefits in terms of taxes for companies uh, uh, investing in university or research groups to develop research. And uh, I had a project with Huawei, the company. It was a project uh, in cooperation with another university, and they wa were interested in the develop some technologies, in my case, in, in uh, artificial intelligence, applied to law, but also artificial intelligence uh, to uh, healthcare, and uh, also to the fishing. Uh, the professor from a university uh, nearby Ribeirão Preto had a, a very interesting project using artificial intelligence for fish. So, but not the case here. W what does they propose? They uh, send to us uh, equipment, computers, um, and we develop the applications for that computers. So we had a, a strong cooperation uh, in this scenario. And it, it, in my case specifically. I know that, uh, for instance, in the uh, 5G implementation in Brazil, we are in course now, uh, the most of people said, so Huawei to be the most player, et cetera, et cetera. But if you see the, uh, the competition, the Huawei was not in scenario, but uh, the Huawei was in the background the equipment to connection, uh, all uh, they are all from Huawei. 
Uh, I know that because uh, in that corporation, uh, the, the Chinese uh, chairman there uh, told us about that. So you, you have uh, this uh, strong cooperation. And don't you perceive this a bit dangerous? I mean, in the, uh, don't you perceive this a bit dangerous, this kind of relationship with uh, UAE and uh, uh, so China technology? In, in, in my case, I didn't see any, any problem. Uh, ju just the only problem we have, because uh, when the equipment are going to Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro said something related to China. They just stopped for no, waiting a little minute. Uh, that was the just uh, the problem. We ha we are for f we were for free to develop the, the things just to present it to 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 to, to them. And uh, we also visited the the supply chain uh, center they have in, in Sorocaba a city nearby Sao Paulo, is uh, for the Brazilians another world. It's very, very big, all controlled by uh, IoT and uh, robots, etc. And I believe that this cooperation is, is very important. Uh, regarding specifically my, my university, we have uh, an agreement with uh, a Chinese university but we have no so much interchange of uh, students. We have the agreement, but no projects or uh, students um, uh, changing the, the words for, for the moment. I know just one case of a, a Brazilian student there and a Chinese student uh, in my classes. And I, I'd like to add uh, about what he said. For example, Paraguay is one of the <coughs> few countries that doesn't have any diplomatic uh, relations with China. We have relations with Taiwan, and Taiwan invests a lot in, in Paraguay in terms of they give grants for everybody. It's like every, if you want to go to Taiwan, they, you can go. Basically, to study, uh, I think it's Mandarin, the, the language, and it's all free. They pay everything. Actually, they're, they, they are building, or they're going, I'm not sure yet, but they're going to build a uh, university of uh, engineering with, with uh, Taiwanese uh, professors in, in Paraguay. And that would be the first uh, example of a university that would be all in English. So yes, that everything will be in English. So, so this is possible to, yes. <laughs> to yes, uh, develop so. or this kind of cooperation. And I, I just know that uh, between Paraguay and Taiwan, this is one of the most, uh, the, the strongest and and uh, like the uh, the uh, most. Uh, 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 long uh, term uh, cooperation because uh, since nine, uh, 1957, if I remember well, you have established this uh, kind of diplomatic relationship and you are very, very close in this cooperation. But this Sunday, <laughs> you'll have the presidential election. Yes, we have election. And this is one of the issues uh, yes, during is. the presidential campaign. Still have uh, the relationship with Taiwan that's strong, and I, I believe that in uh, the uh, technological um, uh, field and maybe the cooperation between universities, this is really something that yes. you uh, uh, that you appreciate and 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 should keep to. But the other candidate, presidential candidate, just says no. Let's uh, start uh, this kind of relationship with China instead, yes, yes, because yes. they need our soya beans, for instance, exactly. and we will build our power uh, as, as, as the soya bean exporters. Yes. So well, how do you perceive this? One of the main, uh, like, so to speak, the people that are, they want to uh, have relationships with, chi with China is that Taiwan doesn't have any real economic cooperation. It's mostly like uh, donations and like giving money to Paraguay to stay loyal in, in many ways, right? And actually there's, uh, there is, there is uh, 
uh, economic exchange with China. It's just not official. So we, I think we exchange more with China than with Taiwan and in terms of goods. And, and on the other hand, uh, what I was going to say, I remember, I forgot. I lost the idea, but I was... Okay, <laughs> anyway, uh, the people from the audience, do you have any comments on this issue or questions to speakers? On so, so that? China buys a lot of meat of Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I remember now. So okay. one, we export a lot of beef to Russia, for example. Uh -oh. that was, and now that the, the restriction, I think it's, it's, it, it's all, it, either totally black or, or just a few percent of the original uh, export. So we have a huge problem because Russia was one of our main uh, receivers of our beef. And that was a lot of money for, for us. Please uh, uh, export more beef to, to Poland. We will uh, welcome well, Yesterday this I went problem. to a nice restaurant and, and, and the meat looks, to me, tastes like Paraguayan. Yeah. Maybe it was. And uh, you students, uh, do you know that whenever you go to, I don't know, Costa Coffee or whatever uh, chain uh, here in Katowice, for instance, to buy your cappuccino with soya milk, all this soya milk comes from Paraguay. Yes, yes. I, I, I did a little bit of research also. So, any questions, comments concerning the products from Paraguay or Brazil? No. Okay. So I, I would maybe I change the topic. I have the question, very trivial but actual, um, and this global issue. I suppose it is Chat GPT to Professor Professor Deberto is a computer science professor. So Professor, what is your attitude towards the Chat GTP? It is a threat for uh, e-learning or just a joke? How, what is your attitude toward this? Um, it's an interesting topic. <laughs> yeah. uh, at the first moment, we, I, I got some scared about Chat GPT. I just uh, think by myself, oh, I believe I lost my position. Uh, and as a professor, the, the students can now reach or have the answers for everything. But uh, we have a comma there. Because uh, in my point of view, I can think, okay, ChatGPT can give you our, the answers, but uh, uh, are they the right answers? Uh, that's my first... Uh, uh, point for thinking about. And after that, I just uh, think, okay, uh, that uh, uh, position, if you are has an enemy, why not to be a friend of this enemy? Why not uh, to try to change the view about the use of chat GPT? Uh, and uh, I have some experimental uh, case in my course now I, I have a course in, in programming language in Python programming language and I said to students you are free to use ChatGPT if you want mm -hmm. let's control the, the experiment here um, we are going during this semester uh, the course is hands-on 100 uh, uh, percent of the time I uh, uh, every class, the students uh, develop scripts, and I just uh, tell, to the, tell to the students now, so guys, today my topic of class is, uh, for instance, if statement. Ask to chat GPT about uh, if statement. And they ask and give me the answers, and they discuss about the answers. Okay, that sensor seems to be uh, the right one. Or, no, this is not so interesting. Let's uh, ask a little bit better. And at the most of the time, the students are uh, liking this uh, the situation. And I also ask, so, to deploy a, a, a script to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. 
and sometimes they ask, uh, they ask to chat GPT and the answer is completely wrong. They just copy and paste to the uh, IDE, to the, the, the Python interpreter, and the result is not that result. And they just go, I believe it's not uh, right. Okay, so I'm excluding there, but uh, I believe for learning it can be a lie, depending on the situation. Um, I also have uh, some discussion with some lawyers regarding ChatGPT because there is a, a, a point of view that uh, ChatGPT will be uh, a substitute for the lawyers. You can ask it to lawyer or to ChatGPT, oh, I have uh, this problem, how can I solve using the justice? And uh, probably ChatGPT will uh, write to you uh, I don't know, petition, or, uh, <laughs> initial, uh, but I, I, did, I don't yes. have any student about that. I have a student about yeah. application of the education, and for a while, um, I can tell you, so for me, ChatGPT can be an ally. Uh, I yes. don't know in the future, well, but uh, I use it as a tool to my class. Mm -hmm. uh, we lawyers, we're going to find ways to regulate that. Actually, that's the, that's the debate now, right? How to regulate something like that. Um, I don't know if people, do you, uh, are you, I mean, do you agree with the regulation or do you want it to be free? Another problem would be if it's very highly regulated, but what if we have the, uh, a dark chat GPT, right? Which be, uh, so it, probably it, they are already. Uh, in, in the point uh, of technological, for, uh, in the technological point of view, um, ChatGPT is a supervised method. Mm. So you can input the training data set, and from this data set, you can get the answers. Uh, if you have a wrong input, you probably have a wrong output. And that's the point of attention, um, in, in my point of view. If you input wrong, uh, wrong things, Probably you can take wrong things using the chat GPT. But for the other side, um, I agree with uh, uh, Evert here. We need the regulamentation. Okay, we have the case on Italy, for instance. In Brazil, we have the discussion, but we have no actions from the government, or et cetera. Uh, we, we have uh, just at, uh, in, in course in Brazil uh, a discussion about uh, a law, uh, okay, you have a law for protecting personal data, for some actions on the internet, but, but not, nothing about uh, artificial intelligence. We have an strategic plan, government strategic plan about uh, artificial intelligence, but not a law. Uh, for their size, for instance, Italy uh, has a, is not allowed to use ChatGPT in Italy. Yeah. Uh, they cut in, in the roots. Uh, I don't know if this is uh, uh, the, the exit, uh, because probably you can be a gap of a technological students. Uh, so, uh, in my point of view, we need to study a little bit more, but at this moment uh, I'm, uh, just uh, thinking this is, can be useful in, in some situations, I, I, I mean. And the, and the other problem is, is you know, <coughs> technology is always one step or two steps ahead of regulation. So when you regulate ChatGPT, then you have a, a new thing and a new thing. Well, actually, when I was uh, flying over to Poland, I was watching a movie. Maybe you remember Ex Machina. Mm -hmm. Have you ever watched that movie? I was so scared. Mm -hmm. I'm like... It's not, it's not only that I'm going to lose my job, maybe, I don't know, uh, it was really scary. And I was listening to an interview with uh, Elon Musk, the, the owner of Tesla, and say we had to regulate this because otherwise we're gone. Yeah, there is a pro problem that the, the, today we have chat GDP, but tomorrow we have another system uh, belonging to artificial intelligence. And I think that in this way, 
and this university role is changing yeah, because of this um, availability of artificial intelligence in e-learning. But on the other side, you mentioned the regulations first or implementation first. Yeah? So we are thinking about the uh, rules and regulations on artificial intelligence, or we just have to implement and then think what we will have to do. So that is two ways yeah, on this. Yeah. And, and I would like to comment on, on, on this because you uh, just ask a question what will be the, the, the role of professors at the universities. Uh, I believe it's changing, of course, but we have to adapt, of course, to new technologies. But as I have a look here, this uh, room, there are many people just losing, uh, using their laptops here, probably some of them listening to us carefully, and some of them even checking. If you said 28%, they will just check, oh, it's the 27, <laughs> it's wrong. Yeah, but still, asking a good question, as you know, is, is the art of the science. And if you are not able to ask a good question, you will not receive a good answer to this and you will not have the uh, uh, ability just to assess this, evaluate yes, this. I, I agree. Like, I remember five years ago or six years ago, I was so upset when students have their, their cell phone. I mean, I'm so boring, I, I was so sad. But then I just realized it's just the way we are now, right? Even you see teenagers, they, they're talking to each other without talking. They're texting and they're sitting next to each other. Mm -hmm. So that, that means the teenagers, they don't want to do, make phone calls anymore. I, I call my son and, and he never picks out the phone. Mm -hmm. He texts me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why there's, nobody wants to talk anymore. And on the other hand, I think the, the new vision of, of, of teaching will be more about, you know, go back to the basics, like philosophy, the, the meaning of things, uh, what's the point of things, because technology comes, everything new, 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 and we never can catch up with all the technology. It's like oh, we always don't know what's going on. Yeah, and I was just astonished uh, by the idea that uh, some uh, uh, business leaders and, and some most powerful people uh, 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 talked about it, we should stop the research of uh, new technologies. So why? <laughs> it's not and possible. And it's impossible, exactly. No, no, it's, of course it's not possible. We have to be, you know, uh, on the trend not behind, yeah. but on the trend. I, I mean the scientists and the researchers, so we have to know and this, understand, and just uh, 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 make it possible to make all the legislation, for exactly. instance. Now, now it's, uh, I heard maybe it was in the US, in, in France, I don't remember, like TikTok is forbidden for like a, a governmental tele uh, cell phones, for example, right? And Everybody uses TikTok now, right? It's, it's, it's a good way to communicate something. I mean, we, uh, we communicate a lot of stuff, like people use that to sell stuff, like, you know, to teach about uh, the law and technology. So it's, it is very useful, but it, it belongs to the Chinese, and that's the problem, right? So yes, and uh, elaborating a little bit more on the subject and just referring to your uh, Ildeberto presentation about the education, yeah, because you talked um, uh, uh, very, uh, uh, some, some basic facts about this, but I would like you to ask maybe both of you, because uh, uh, we, we don't know here in Poland uh, uh, probably much about this, the state of the education, um, especially, I, I mean, higher education in your countries. How do you uh, 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 perceive the change? in last years, just following the uh, technological advances in, in, in the world. Is the higher education, or maybe more broadly the education itself, changing and adapting to new technologies? How do you uh, see this in, in Brazil and Paraguay? Um, how can I answer to you? Because uh, we have uh, very different scenarios. In, in Brazil, depending on the region, depending on the 
the university. Uh, for instance, in, in, in my case, um, University of Sao Paulo, and even uh, in my department we have a different case. I, I try to, to tell you the situation. Um, the beginning of the pandemics, I remember until now, it was at the 16th of March, uh, the Hector uh, just announced uh, suspending the classes. On the next two week, I start my classes on the remote. But uh, some professors uh, late three or five weeks uh, to start the, the classes. Okay, uh, why? Uh, in my specific situation, I already have some use of uh, uh, information technology tools from uh, studying not just the use of technology, but also the pedagogical use of uh, this information technology to tools. My learning environment was a red report. Um, activities and uh, also nowadays I have a, a lot of activities to be performed online. Uh, uh, I, have, I have classes today in Brazil and uh, the students there are uh, doing this class in the remote mode. Okay, I record um, my a little bit talk and I provided exercise to be executed in uh, online mode. Um, so, for me, it was uh, very easy to change, and uh, it was really good. Uh, so, during the International Week, I did yeah, yeah, totally, remember, totally yeah. remote. Uh, and in my point of view, it was really good, really interesting. Mm -hmm. But for other professors in my department, it was very, very difficult. Um, they are not prepared to that. Um, but they delivered the class. Uh, but for the other side, depending on the university, there, uh, there were not prepared. For some federal universities, because in Brazil we have uh, federal universities and uh, state universities. I, was, I am from a state university. We have a, a huge investment. But uh, for federal universities in some states, this year, they are going in course again because they spent uh, almost a year without classes because it has no support to the classes. Uh, so even in University of Sao Paulo, until today, we have a, a problem with uh, poor students who have a, a lot of problem, by programs that uh, we have uh, uh, positions for uh, uh, poor students or considering uh, uh, skin color, etc. Um, but uh, we have uh, two kinds of students. For instance, for the remote, I had the students that has a notebook, a inter good internet connection, and other students has no uh, internet connection. And I need to think about activities to cover that student too. Uh, in my point of view, I, I have uh, success in this case, but uh, I agree that to be a kind of lack. For the other side, I'm observing here a lot of notebooks opened, and uh, I perceive to a lot of students this way, and probably they are using the, the smartphones. And uh, my question is. Who are using ChatGPT to ask some questions about our presentation now, or use it as ChatGPT? Hand up. Oh. For homework. <laughs> for homework, for instance. Yeah. No. <laughs> yes, yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah. But my question is, when you use the ChatGPT, do you usually agree with the information they, they give you? When you, oh, this is not true. I mean, uh, do you always agree with the information they gave you, so if you analyze it? Uh, 
Interesting. Uh, I, I think for the most of you, or for the, all of you, uh, it's not possible, uh, or it's not so uh, interesting to have classes just uh, in the black uh, uh, board, isn't it? Yeah. What do you think about? If I just uh, uh, give up my presentation here just to talk to you about uh, uh, the things without presentation, what do you think about? I believe it's, oh, that professor don't not prepare a PPG presentation. Okay. Um, we have generations, and we need to adapt to do that generations. I know some professors are not so open to that, but uh, we need to, to adapt. The same case to the chat GPT. As I told you, okay, let's use it in my class. Why not? Uh, let's think about together how to use. Yeah, the blackboard and the pencil is going past. Yeah, but the, you see, in the situation, we are talking about digital health. So you can imagine, yeah, by example, you are going to the physicians and this uh, person checking, <laughs> Dr. Google asking for the <laughs> diagnosis of your health status. So I'm not sure how we can believe uh, and trust in these physicians if they will learn uh, from the internet, GTP or whatever. So how to trust in this, you know, diagnosis in this technology, yeah? Uh, so I have, a, I have two cases in, in the health, uh, real cases in, in the health. One is uh, the father of a colleague of mine uh, discovered uh, a month ago uh, a cancer in the brain. Uh, he was okay, he wasn't the bitchy okay, and suddenly he got uh, some uh, bad uh, uh, situation and make some exams and discover the, the, the cancer in, in the brain. Uh, the surgery uh, were made by a kind of a robot. Uh, the situation, the scenario was more or less like that. They, uh, it was not experimental, but they uh, take uh, image, ultrasound, etc., and map the exactly a, a point of the, the cancer. And the incision it was very uh, small, and the robot, uh, using the mapping, just extract uh, a specific uh, uh, cells. Uh, in the border, and it, it was a, a successful uh, surgery because there was a possibility to uh, lost some movements be uh, because uh, the, the tumor was in the region in the brain very uh, sensitive. For a while, he is uh, okay. He is starting the chemotherapy, okay, but uh, it did. Uh, uh, my attention because it was driving by a robot. You have a, a doctors there managing, but uh, we had a, a robot to, to make the surgery. And the other case, we have, a, I don't know the word exactly, diabetes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yes. it. Yes. Uh, I have a colleague that has a get, -get just monitoring the, the skin and send the information about uh, uh, the disease to the, to the doctor. Okay. And when he came to the doctor, um, he has all the data to analyze the period and where they got insulin, etc. Uh, I, I can see benefits in using that. Um, I like to run, okay? And I have my watch. Then monitoring my uh, heart, monitoring my distance, monitoring so everything. That's a kind of uh, uh, data from from help that can can help. Or yeah. an, another example of that would be uh, I just uh, heard that the use of technology in medicine, like for example, you want to get uh, operated by the best doctor in the world, 
So you, the, the best doctor in the world is probably in, I don't know, maybe it's in Germany, but you, you are in Poland. And then they have this kind of robot, but the doctors actually kind of like, if it's like a video game, they have the joystick and they start operating. That's actually happening already. So they operate at distance. So in a distance, I believe uh, you have uh, some uh, very interesting uh, problems to solve. Um, the lag is a really big problem. Uh, the connection is another problem. But in this case, I told you, the doctors are there just uh, driving and managing, as I believe is the correct word, the situation. In case of any problem, uh, it was possible to, uh, to uh, instant uh, change and correct. Uh, okay, I'm not an expert. So <laughs> You're and the still, expert. Uh, my question is, because you are a lawyer, how to guarantee that they do, don't commit a mistake, you know, and uh, who takes the responsibility if there is? Because all the examples are amazing, really, yeah. and <laughs> all these technological advances really uh, help us a lot because yes, this uh, kind of surgery wouldn't be possible without the technology using, for sure. But still, if there is a mistake, maybe in some you know, connection between uh, a, a human and uh, a robot, and maybe, you know, uh, in the procedures, maybe in a, a software, anywhere. So who takes the responsibility? We should know this but now, before. That, that, yeah, it's, it's very complicated. I, I have seen many lawsuits in, in Paraguay regarding malpractice, but the problem is, it's, you know, every, every human being is different. So you have the technique, you follow the technique uh, specifically, but then you have another problem, and then you die. So uh, that's probably not the responsibility of the doctor. That was some condition that you previous have. So in order to determine the, the, who is to blame, you have to actually follow if he did all the procedures the way they were supposed to do. That was the only way that you can determine if they can take the blame or the responsibility for if they didn't follow the instructions. That is the only way. Yeah, there is. Uh, I see two issues, and one issue is is robots and robotization. I would say, so they maybe would be helpful for physicians in any uh, industry to um, realize the simple task, yeah? the routine work is realized by the robots. On the other side, there is a problem of um, the analysis of data, like you mentioned about this cancer, brain cancer. So you collect a lot of data, uh, they call it artifacts, yeah? something what is uh, abnormal. So there is a problem if the, um, of medicine and uh, not strictly telemedicine, but medicine, uh, medicine and healthcare. Uh, thinking and collecting the data, the huge um, archive of data, and diagnosis uh, within the, uh, with the uh, artificial intelligence algorithm uh, on this data. So then there is a problem how to um, properly um, use this artificial intelligence for diagnosis, for prediction. Yeah. So, can you comment this issue? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, it, so, uh, I, I will give uh, some conclusion before my uh, explanation. <laughs> uh, in my, con uh, my conclusion, I, I think we need to stop a little bit to get a little bit slower because we are going so fast and we are not understanding uh, the real potential of uh, data size and uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, that's the first point. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, back into to, to, to the question in my considerations you have us. So we have a lot of data um, and from this data, I believe we have uh, to pay attention in several situations. Um, first, uh, uh, how to structure the data 
and how to make this uh, data trustful. I believe that's an interesting point to, to, to analyze and to discuss. I have no right answer about that. Uh, we are trying to, uh, every time, to take better data. Uh, the other point is related to this data to be open or not. It will be available to others and make research and to check the data and to make a group decision as we are discussing in the, in the, the break. Um, here, I also think that we need to uh, think a little bit more uh, about the methods we are using to and about the data we have to be available. Um, some of the data, for instance, um, uh, medical data, who have uh, uh, very uh, information about the, the, the person, uh, and we need to be uh, very careful about that, uh, to not be available information like specific about Everett, for instance. So, uh, it's a, a net goal, as a professor told us today, for marketing, but you need the ethics and make it this data available. And also for using artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. You have uh, the use for the uh, good size and for the, the, the dark side. The, the dark side. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Back into my conclusion again, we need to get a bit slower and to think about our results because we are going so fast in the, the technology development, mainly regarding artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, I would like uh, to refer shortly to your presentation for a change, uh, Professor Everett. So, um, uh, about uh, this kind of cooperation in the financial sector, let's say, in Paraguay, which was really a nice example how to do it well, and how to do it and how to do it well. So, so maybe it's a, a, a worthful lesson also for, for us here, although the country is bigger and we are in the middle of the European Union, so we have to uh, I don't know, keep to all the procedures uh, in, uh, within the, this integration um, uh, block. But still, I would like uh, to ask you if you consider it is possible to uh, implement a common currency maybe in Mercosur, because, you know, uh, from time to time, the ta uh, the, 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 this uh, subject just uh, comes back and you talk about. So I would like to know your thoughts about if this is a realistic option or not, just, uh, a, a, you know, having a look uh, at what's happening here in, uh, in Europe, for, uh, for, in, uh, for instance. And what's uh, the... Uh, role of uh, the National Bank of Paraguay in all this scheme that you talked about. So, is it present or not? And what's uh, the role, I, I mean, of the government and maybe of the National Bank? Is it helping or just stopping this? Okay, uh, on, on the first uh, question, I, I, I would like to follow the Pol Polish example. I will remain with the Guarani, which is our currency. Actually, the Brazilians and Argentinians, they thought about having a single currency. But for us, it would be, I don't think it would be a good idea. And all the prices will be up, and then, I don't know, and we're still like a, very poor. And we will be very in detrimental of our interest to, to change that. And then we see some examples of Argentina uh, uh, changing its currency to one to one to the dollar and then end up in a disaster. Also Ecuador. And I don't think that's possible now. Who knows in the future, but maybe when we all got rich with, through the agreement with the European Union, maybe we can. 
Well, we can change that. We discussed a little bit about that yesterday, uh, yesterday during, during the, the, the dinner about uh, why the dollar is the, the, the strongest currency today. But uh, back into our scenario on Mercosul, we have a first to decide economical and also political uh, decisions, but uh, we are so far from that, I believe. Yes, and to answer the, the the last question, we had a big crash in '95. It was a, it was internal. Uh, all the banks, uh, like I would say, more than half of the banks uh, went bankrupt because there were no enough regulations. And after that, in '96, they they made the a law which was very more, very good a good law, and that actually that law. Uh, the, the central bank was already created, but with this law, they give them a specific task. And, the, and one of the good things about that law is, was that it allows uh, the bank to be completely independent from, the, from politicians. So it's a good example of a, um, usually the, the, the head of the central bank uh, have master, doc, PhD in the United States or in England or in Europe. So these are very highly qualified people. So, so far, it's, it's still independent. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Okay, what is the inflation rate in Paraguay? I think it's, it's not that high. It's a, a, maybe like 6 or 7% now. It's getting higher, but it was really controlled for more, over 20 years. But now it's getting... So you are in a better situation than we are here in Poland. <laughs> so this is, again, Thank very, you so much. This is very optimistic uh, sign uh, for the future. Anyway, we have to, we have to finish a very interesting uh, debate, uh, the discussion about the socio-economic uh, challenges uh, and the future possibilities of the cooperation. Anyway, thank you so much for getting uh, us to the very far continent very close. So right now we know much more about it and we see the opportunities how we can cooperate on the university level, on the business level and also on the cultural level. So thank you very much. It was really, really a pleasure uh, to host you and thank you so much that even you are very busy, you find the time to come to Poland, to, to, to Katowice and to share with us your knowledge and experience. And I strongly believe that uh, the being you present here, not online, is much, much better and much, much profitable uh, here for our students and for all of us. So thank you very much.